There was a first grade teacher that was talking to all the kids and giving him an illustration of how to uh, industrious it was and how ants were good things. And the teacher was talking about the little ants and the ant went out and he worked every day and he worked and did this and he worked in the colony and he was so helpful. She said, boys and girls, there, this is a wonderful example of the life of the ant. Every day the ant goes to work and he works all day and at the end what happens? And little Johnny at the back row stood up his hand and he said, teacher, then someone steps on the ant. <laughs> what is depression? And what does God have to say to us about depression? Is this how you feel or have felt? No one has told you that life would be like this. Your job's a joke and you're broke. Your love life's dead on arrival. It's like you're stuck in second gear, and sometimes I think even first gear. It's not been your day, it's not been your week, it's not been your month, and it hasn't been your year. What is depression? And what is God's purpose for it? And what part does it play for you and I in God's scheme of things? 9.5% of all Americans are depressed. Women, by the way, have more likelihood of showing up to the doctor being depressed. But did you know that men are six to seven times more likely to have depressive symptoms than women? But they never seek help for it. So it's a common part of everyday life. It's a common part of my life. I'm not proud to say it, but I have depression in my family. I have had serious issues with these areas myself. And I bring to you this morning what I have gleaned through hard lessons. Hard, hard lessons. Many years ago, there was a young Midwestern lawyer who suffered from such great depression that his friends went into his house and he took all the knives and razors out of his house so he wouldn't hurt himself. That man was Abraham Lincoln and he became the 16th president of the United States. Job was depressed. Job in the Bible. He cursed the very day he was born. Job 3, 11 and 26. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. David got depressed. King David. He said in Psalm 6, 2 to 3 and 6, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? I am worn from my groanings, and all night I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Moses got depressed. Numbers 11 talks about him being surrounded with all these Israelites. And complain, complain, complain. And he got depressed. Spurgeon, the great theologian and pastor, and probably felt to be one of the great, greatest pastors and expositors of the scriptures in the late 1800s, suffered from depression. He would take off two to three months every once in a while and go to southern France and stay in a little cottage and recoup. And I want to read to you what Spurgeon wrote in a book called Letters to My Students, to Young Pastors. Quote, First among them I must mention the great hour of success, when at last a long-cherished desire is fulfilled, when God has been glorified by our means, and a great triumph achieved, then we are as apt to faint. It might be imagined that amid special favor, our soul would soar to heights of ecstasy and rejoice with joy unspeakable, but it is generally the reverse. The Lord seldom exposes his warriors to the perils of exaltation over victory. He knows that few of them can endure such a test, and therefore he dashes their cup with bitterness. End of quotes. Here's a pastor, a man of God, who was used to convert and change the lives of thousands in the city of London in the late 1800s, confessing that he himself has a problem with depression. Remember John the Baptist? 
John the Baptist is out there. He is being this prophet of God. He's going out in the Jordan River and Jesus comes down the walkway and he baptizes him. And the dove comes down on Jesus. And John says, Behold the Son of God. Jesus is his cousin. And Herod throws him in prison. And he sits in prison for months and months and months. And Jesus doesn't do anything to get him out. And John the Baptist gets depressed. In fact, he sends the messengers, some of his disciples, to Jesus. And he says, are you really the one? Are you really him? You see, when things go bad, and we are depressed, and everything goes wrong, it's easy to doubt God or what's happening. I believe depression is an appropriate God-given emotion to certain stimulus. We today tell ourselves, I'm a Christian, I couldn't be depressed, and I can't be depressed. Some people look at depression as sin. But I believe that depression is something that God allows to happen in our lives. It appears consistently in the lives of God's children in both the Old and the New Testament and in the lives of some of the greatest Christian leaders and expositors in our time. Elijah, we're going to talk, to about, talk about this morning. Elijah is one of the greatest prophets of the Scripture Old Testament. He had a problem with depression. This is a man that went from the heights of Baal worship and Ashtaroth worship, where there were on Mount Carmel, and I have been on that site, where, or it looks over the Jezreel Valley, what we call Megiddo. And 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Ashtaroth, and they do their thing. You remember how what happens in the story? They do their thing, and nothing happens. And at the end of the e- time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah goes and builds up the broken altar of God. He puts the sacrifice on it with the wood. He digs a trench around it, and he has them handicap it by pouring barrels of water on it. And he gets down on his knees and he prays. And you know the story. God sends fire down from heaven, consumes the oxen, the wood, the altar, the stones, and the water. And all the people says, Jehovah is God. And Elijah and the people slay 850 prophets. And the people are going to return to God. There's been a famine for three and a half years in the land. And the people are desperate. And Elijah gets down on his knees and he prays for rain. In fact, if you look in the chapter before, he gets down on his knees and he prays for rain and there's no rain. In fact, Elijah, interestingly enough, prays seven times for rain. On the seventh, and he keeps asking his servant, are there any clouds? No, there's no clouds. And the seventh time, his servant says, yeah, I see a little little cloud way over on the Mediterranean. Elijah says, yes, go tell Ahab, it's going to rain. Get on your chariot, run down to to Jezreel, to the palace. Because you're going to get stuck in the mud if you don't leave right now. And by the time he gets there, Elijah runs and follows his chariot right to Jezreel. By the time they get there, it's pouring rain. And the, fa- and the famine is broken. How does Elijah respond when Jezebel gives him the ultimatum? I'm going to do to you just like you did to all those prophets. Here's this mighty man of God that has been on the peak mountaintop experience. The nation is turning to God. And he runs. The scripture says he's gripped with fear. And he runs past Jerusalem. Carmel is up in the top of northern Israel. He runs down to past Jerusalem. He goes south of Jerusalem down to Beersheba. It's in the desert by now. He leaves his helper at Beersheba. And he takes off on his own. 
Dorothy read it. He says, I'm the only one. This is how he feels. All people struggle with depression and loneliness at different times in their life. It's part of the human condition. But the story of Elijah has several things that I want to bring out that I think are important in dealing with depression. First of all, one word, rest. Then as he slept under a broom tree, or a juniper tree, some scriptures say, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. There's a point where you have to get rest, and you have to take care of your bodies after big emotional highs. Christ told his disciples, Come aside by yourself to a deserted place and rest a while. See, even Jesus knew that you can't live on an emotional high and a high, high, high all the time. Even people doing good and working for the Lord need to get away and rest. That's why we send our pastor away to rest, to rejuvenate in the Spirit of God. The next thing is that Elijah goes to Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is the mountain of God. This is the original Sinai where the Ten Commandments were, go- <coughs> were given. Horeb is in southern Ara- uh, <coughs> Saudi Arabia. It was known as the mountain of God. It's like Elijah today going to where God is, going to the church. He goes where he can meet God. He wants to reconnect with God. And it's an important part of dealing with depression is to remain and keep in a right relationship with the Lord. How do we recommit and reconnect with God? Psalms 119.25, David says, My soul clings to the desert, but I am revived according to your word. Revived according to your word. So there's a place when we get depressed and we don't feel like God is answering, we don't feel like God is there, and we don't feel like God understands, the heavens are like brass, and it looks like our prayers hit the wall and bounce down and go in the toilet. That's the time when I have to believe and trust that if I get into the Word, He will understand. The second thing that Elijah did is he spent time in prayer... Matthew 11.28 says it all. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I've read descriptions of people who are severely depressed where even rest seems better, sleeping seems better than living. Number three, we need to confess our sins. Psalms 32, 1 to 3, 5 and 11. Oh, what joy there is for those whose sins are forgiven. Joy. When I refused to confess my sin, this is David speaking, when I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable. I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. This is a key thought in depression. I will express... And confess my rebellion to the Lord. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the rock of depression is. And what I call the rock. That rock is really rights. For God comes to Elijah and he points him back to what his real kingdom mission is. He says to Elijah, why are you here? What's your reason on this earth for? 1 Kings 19, 13. Go your way and anoint Azariah. You see, God really has a plan for your life. And part of dealing with depression is coming to a point where I know where and what God wants me to be and do. Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him that sent me. You see, Jesus understood that 
part of the reason for being for man and women so we don't get depressed is to understand my food is to do the will of him that sent me. And last, if you look at the story of Elijah, the next principle is get with relationships. Verse 19, so Elijah departed and found Elisha. He got somebody to talk to and help him. What is the root cause of depression? What causes and makes depression? And I believe it's what we call rights. And how you deal with what rights you think you have. And if you try to keep your own rights, you'll end up eventually being depressed. You see, we all have rights that we think I deserve because I'm a human being and I'm alive. I have the right to be treated nice. I have a right to be understood by my wife. I have the right to have a good job. I have a right for somebody not to take away my reputation and my job or my money or whatever. They're all rights. But you see, God wants you and I to surrender our rights as you go through depression. And I believe this is the main reason why God brings us to the point of depression is to bring us to a point where we realize that there are rights in our lives that we've not surrendered to Him. Because it is only when we are depressed and we are at the bottom of the road, when you're at the end of the rope and you want to let go, that you start to realize that it's not my rights that I want to keep. I want to give those rights to God. And God looks after them better than we do. Here are some tips I've learned. Number one, I need to realize that God is working through the actions of those who offend me. God is working through the actions of my offender. Genesis 50, 20. This is a story of Joseph. Joseph has gone through hell. You remember the story. He's been just about killed. He's been deserted by his brothers. He goes to Potiphar's house. He gets thrown in prison. He languishes in prison. He finally gets out and he's the bigwig prime minister of Egypt. And he saves the then known world from destruction from seven years of famine. And now he's brought all his brothers to Egypt. And he is dying. And he calls all his brothers around. Genesis 50 verse 20. He may think it for evil for us, but God made means it for good. He may think it evil for us, but God means it for good. This is Joseph talking about that situation. You see, his brothers are scared spitless that now that he's going to die, that maybe they're going to be on the hook. As God is saying, listen, the offender, God is using that offender and the offense in our life to bring it for good in my life. Number two, God wants us to thank God for the benefits He plans to bring from each of these offenses. That's a tough one. Thessalonians 5, 8, give thanks in all things. Let's talk about that for just a minute because we confuse thanksgiving and being thankful with giving thanks. The scripture says give thanks in all things. It doesn't say be thankful in all things. Thanking God is an act of my will. Being thankful is an emotion. God is not asking me to have the emotion of being thankful. God has asked me me to be thankful and to give thanks for the offense that happens. You see, you and I don't want to give thanks because we think that giving thanks is the same as being thankful for this nonsense and that crap that's going on in our lives. And God says, "Uh uh-uh, you don't have to be thankful for that mess, but you've got to be willing to thank me for it. Because when I am willing to say thank you, Father, 
for this mess that I'm in, this situation, and this terrible thing that's happening in my life. It means that I am close to Him and He can work through that situation because I'm at that point where I am coming close to surrendering those rights. The third point is it helps us discern the character qualities that God wants to develop in me through this offense. Is it love? Maybe He wants more meekness, patience, faith, gentleness self-control. We know what those things are in our lives. And the last point, and this is for Christians and those of you who are believers, expect to suffer for doing right as a normal part of a Christian living. Philippians 1.9, it says, Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This doesn't say most of you will or some of you will. It says all of us who live godly in Christ Jesus, it's going to come sometime no matter what. We're all going to go through this mess. Last of all, we need to surrender our rights to God. The right to express my opinion without being jumped on. The right to be accepted as an individual. The right to plan how my time will be used. My right to privacy. The right to earn and spend money. The right to choose my friends. The right to control the use of my personal belongings. My right to be understood. You can add your own rights. You know what they are. But God wants us to come to the point where he says, I give you my rights. My right to whatever that is, that the offense that he's bringing me through, that's causing this depression. You see, God always takes good care of his property. How are we to give our rights to God? There's a simple illustration in the scripture of Abraham. Abraham Abraham finally gets his promised son, Isaac. You remember the story? This is his little one. He's, He's tried to work it out himself and he got Ishmael and it wasn't supposed to be the one. And finally he gets Isaac. And I would be willing to bet... Sarah and, I, and Abraham babied and coddled this little fella like you wouldn't believe. This is the special one that they've been promised. And God finally tells Abraham, you're going to take this young man, he probably was a fairly young man, in probably 20 to 30, you're going to take him up to Mount Moriah, and you're going to build an altar there, and you're going to slay him. That's giving up the rights, right? That's where the rubber meets the road. Abraham has come to the point, God saying, I want your son, the one I promised you. You remember the story, Abraham does it. You see, in Abraham's mind, Abraham has given up the right to his son. In Abraham's mind, in fact, if you study that story very carefully, you will find that in Abraham's mind, it's not his problem, it's God's problem. Because if he's going to kill him, God's going to have to raise him or something's going to have to happen. It's not my problem. See, God had brought Abraham to the point where he was willing to give that right up. And you and I have to come to the point for us to be willing and able to get rid of depression, to come to that same point of dedication that Abraham did where we bow down before the altar of God and say, I give you my right for my job. I give you my right to be understood. I give you my right for a happy marriage. I give you my right for this or that or whatever it is. I give it to you without reservation. Then we need to thank God for whatever happens. You see, it's an act of the will We come to that altar and I say, I dedicate my self-will. I dedicate my clothes. I dedicate my partner. I dedicate my money. I dedicate my job. I dedicate my knowledge, my friends, my music, my future, my time, my schedule. Whatever it is that God is dealing with you through the offenses that have happened to make you depressed. 
then something interesting happens. Once you dedicate it to God, always expect God to test if you really dedicated those rights to Him. You'll test it, believe me. Because He wants to know if you and I have really said, Yes, Lord, it's yours. God allows depression into our lives to warn us that we need to deal with something. What are the things in your life that you need to deal with? Is it loss, anger, abuse, poor decisions of the past? The simple question that comes to us this morning that you need to decide is who is going to control the rights in your life? Dr. Norman Wright He's a famous author, has written almost 50 books. Dorothy and I went to his, he lives in Bakersfield, by the way, and he's written almost 50 books. And he has a very interesting way of looking at depression. This is what he says. Depression is being like a person in a deep pool of water, holding on to a large rock. And I look at this rock as all of the rights, my rights that I want for my life. The rock will pull us down. The rock is heavy. And if we refuse to let it go, it will pull us down and destroy us. It is not the rock that will destroy us. It is the decision not to let the rock go that will destroy us. We need to decide we are going to let the depression go by letting go of my rights and giving those rights to God. As we close, I want you to look at what God didn't tell Elijah. God didn't come to him and say, Sorry, Elijah, I know you've got a chemical imbalance. Prozac hasn't been invented yet, so I can't help you. Instead, God came to Elijah the way Elijah needed to be come to by God in that still, small voice, and he healed Elijah's depression. God didn't come to Elijah and say, get a hold of yourself, you're depressed. You're a minister and preacher of the gospel. You shouldn't be acting like this. No, God treated Elijah gently and softly. God doesn't come to Elijah and offer God counsel and offer Elijah counsel. God doesn't have a face-to-face talk with Elijah and try to set him straight. Instead, he uses that still small voice to talk to the heart of Elijah. Let's review how God dealt with Elijah. First of all, God sent him to church where God was, Mount Horeb. Secondly, God had Elijah tell him what the problem was and had Elijah yield his rights. Third, God directed him to say, what are you doing here, Elijah? Fourth, God gave Elijah something to do. Go anoint Hazarel. Fifth, God gave Elijah a friend. Elisha. I want us to end with a story about J.C. Penney, the man who started J.C. Penney Department Stores. I'm going to read it for you because it's very illustrative and has a lot of correlations to what's happening in our today economy. During the first part of the 20th century, J.C. Penney was a real man who presided over a real and powerful empire of over 1,700 stores. For 1929, that's quite a few stores. That's amazing. And at the time, he had the country's largest chain of department stores, each one bearing his name. But although his enterprise made him incredibly wealthy, J.C. Penney's life was not devoid of setbacks and troubles. In fact, beginning in in 1929, events took place that nearly cost Penney his life. When the Great Depression struck the country. It became at a time of great financial vulnerability for Penny. In the good times before the Depression, Penny had overextended himself and had borrowed heavily to finance many of his ventures. But when the Depression hit, banks began to recast repayment of his loans sooner than he had anticipated. And suddenly cash flow was tight, and Penny was finding it hard to difficult to meet the payment schedules. Constant and unrelenting worry began to take a toll. And it was, I was so harassed, he writes, with the worries that I couldn't sleep and developed an extremely painful ailment, end of quotes, he said. Concerned about his deteriorating health, Penny checked himself into the Kellogg Sanatorium at Battle Creek, Michigan. That was kind of like the Mayo Clinic of his day. 
And there, Dr. Elmer Eggleston, a staff member, <coughs> a physician, examined Penny and declared that he was extremely ill. Penny later recalled a rigid treatment was pres prescribed, but nothing helped. He was to <coughs> constantly tormented by periods of hopelessness and despair. His very will to live was rapidly eroding. I got weaker day by day. I was broken, nervously and physically, filled with despair, unable to even see a ray of hope. I had nothing to live for. I felt that I hadn't a friend in the world, that even my family had turned against me. Alarmed by his rapidly deteriorating condition, Dr. Eggleston gave Penny a sedative. However, the effect quickly wore off, and Penny awakened with the conviction that he was living his last night of his life. Getting out of bed, I wrote farewell letters to my wife and to my son, saying that I did not expect to see the dawn. You see, Penny is at the bottom. He's at the end of the rope. Penny awakened the next morning, surprised to find himself alive. And making his way down the hallway of the hospital, he could hear singing from the little chapel where devotional exercises were held each morning. And the words of a hymn he heard being sung spoke deeply to him. Going into the chapel, he listened to the singing, the reading of the scripture lesson, and the prayer. He writes, Suddenly something happened, he said. I can't explain it. I can only call it a miracle. I felt as if I had been instantly lifted out of the darkness of a dungeon into a warm and brilliant sunlight. And I felt as if I had been transported from hell to paradise. I felt the power of God as I had never felt it before. In a life-transforming instant, Penny knew that God with his love was there to help. And from that day to this, my life has been free from worry, he declared. The most dramatic and glorious 20 minutes of my life were those I spent in that chapel that morning. The words from that hymn that spoke so eloquently and miraculously to J.C. Penny were the words in Psalm 90, in the hymn book number 90. What is the end of depression when God deals with it his way and we give our rights to him? Remember David? David, who is so depressed. Psalms 40, 1 to 2. I waited patiently on the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. What was the result for Job? Job 42, 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. Paul got depressed and sad because he had this thorn in his life that he prayed three times God to take it away, and God says, uh uh not doing it. Second Corinthians 12.9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in your weakness. You see, God's prescription for Paul was a promise. My grace is sufficient for you. That promise only works if we believe, we must trust, and we must ask. The most hopeless people in the world are the people who recognize that they have a problem but have no vision from God on how to solve it. I want you to turn in number 90. And we're going to sing that hymn. She's going to come up and help us sing. This is a song that J.C. Penny heard. We're going to sing each each stanza of it, God will take care of you. <clears throat> 90, number 90, page 9 0. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Or all the way, or all the way, he'll take care of you. 
God will take care of you. Let's pitch it just up a little bit. Though days of hell when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fear your path assail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day. Let's bow our heads, every eye closed, every one of us talking to the Lord, saying, Father, what rights do I have in my life that I haven't given to you that's causing depression in my life? Or maybe it's what rights do I need to give to you so that I won't have depression come up in my life at a future time? God wants each one of us to come to that point where we say, Father... I come and lay it at the altar just as Abraham did. And I give it to you this morning if you want me to pray for you for that wisdom to let go. I just want you to put your hand up real quick. Down, yes, yes, sister, yes, brother. Yes, 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 yes. Anyone else? Yes, 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 brother. Yes, sister. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bring to you these people, Father, that have raised their hands, Lord God. Depression is part of our existence. Show us what we need to let go of. What rights we need to give to you. Lord, show us and let us be willing to be willing. And then when you test us to see if those rights have really been given, Lord, anoint this congregation with the power to say, Yes, I have done it. It's yours, Lord. And may victory come from depression for all in Jesus' name. Amen.